some stuff that started coming in and we've got some really cute stuff. So you can either order online, you can bring it to church with you next Sunday, or you can have it shipped here. Do you want me to talk about the table? Okay. And at the table, we have some volunteer opportunities for um, this coming week. We need volunteers to help with lawn care, cleaning the church, um, and there's some other volunteer opportunities for next Sunday. There is also another list. We're asking people to bring a side dish. There's some stuff that we're requesting, like sliced cheese, tomatoes, what else, lettuce, and onions, if you want to do that, and then just another side dish to bring to go with the hamburgers and hot dogs. Awesome. So make sure that you check out that list, okay? It's going to be a really, really fun and powerful day, I really believe. And for those of you that were able to come to our Global Harvest Christian School awards ceremony um, and graduation on Thursday night, wow, what a powerful night. And I think God just showed up, and he just showed what he's doing. And I think many of you saw the scope of the impact that the school is having. And we're already getting stuff for the kitchen shower from parents and grandparents just in the school. Right? That's already happening. And uh, it was just a really, really powerful night. We're really thankful uh, to Crystal Rock for hosting us. And I'm just thankful for all of you that came and were a part of that and prayed for that and just support the vision of what God's doing through Global Harvest Christian School. And um, one of our graduates spoke, and what an incredible testimony. It was so, so wonderful. Did you have something to do with that? What's that? Yeah, so it's just that. <laughs> Jamie says, thank you. <laughs> right, so uh, what a great moment. So thank you guys for just believing. And uh, our, you know, we as a church are really impacting the community, but our school is is going into places that it's difficult for churches. We're, we're, we're changing families that are both churched and unchurched. Amen. Right? And it, it really is. Amen. It's awesome. It's shifting a culture in this city. So thank you guys for your giving, your prayers, your support, and uh, I'm just excited about what the Lord's doing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Any other announcements? I think that's it. So, so next Sunday is going to be fun. Right? I think it's going to be a powerful time. Amen. Now, let's take an offering. Uh, let's, uh, you can always give online at globalharvestchurch.co. Uh, if you want to give cash giving, there are envelopes at the back so we can take, keep track of your giving for tax purposes. Uh, you can give check, all those things. So let's just stand together. And let's make our offering declaration. Amen. Heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, impartations, angelic visitations, declarations, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations. Souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen. So praise God. Thank God for his goodness, his faithfulness. We're thankful. Amen. Hallelujah. Happy birthday to Riley Joe. Anybody else have a birthday during the last week? Sarahlyn, that's right. Right? Happy birthday to Sarahlyn. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and dismiss kids to go to their program. The children's church, the nursery. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this
this morning, uh, I, I titled this sermon, hallelujah, The Call to Labor and Dig. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Amen. Now, you know, one of the things, when Joe Moody was with us just a couple of weekends ago, and we had a really powerful time with Joe and her team in the services, but also behind the scenes. And uh, there were a lot of encouraging things that Joe said to us, a lot of exhortations, a lot of instructions. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, first of all, I want to commend you guys because uh, her team was blown away, and I've said this to some, by our hospitality as a church. And they said, you guys just went above and beyond hosting our team. And not only that, they said it was very, very easy to minister, she said, because of the ongoing intercession that happens here. And so they, they just bragged on you guys. And so I want to brag on you as well. Okay? Praise God. Now, part of that is because we've dug a well of revival. We've created something over the years that there is a presence and a glory of God that we have contended for and that is present. Amen. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think Joe said it publicly. Uh, I know she said it to us privately along with some other things that I'll get to in a few moments. But one of the things she said, and I think she said it even on her Sunday morning service or the prophetic words she gave us on Saturday. She said, you've dug a deep well of his presence here in a very dry place. Amen. She said, but it's time for expansion. And he's going to send you and raise up mature harvesters. Because how many of you understand that when God starts talking about expansion, there's a demand. Right? Because... When expansion comes, how many of you, when you've ever had a business and the business starts expanding, can things keep going the way they were before? Yeah. There's a demand, right? And we're in this, we have this great problem at the moment. Even in the school, right? We literally have no more space to put students. We literally have no teachers. The teachers we have are great, but we just need more. Thank you. To, and was like, what about us, right? <laughs> but there, there's this demand for expansion, and we're limited because of the amount of teachers that we have. There's just so much that we can do, and we have a waiting list of like over 30 students waiting to get in the school. We had 100% return from last year, so that's where we are as a school. Um, her phone is blowing up all day Friday after graduation from people who came and saw what our school looked like and said, we want our kids in this. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and I know this Sunday isn't very telling, but our sanctuary is getting packed out. Right? Uh, this is a vacation weekend. Graduations are happening. People are in, around the country going to graduations and all those things. But there, there's expansion upon us. Now, I want to just give some, I think when someone gives us a word like that, it's important to not just be like, oh, that's a great word, let's move on. But I think it's important to unpack it and give some understanding for us as the body of Christ. Now, there's, there's a big difference between an outpouring and digging a well in a region. Now, now ideally, you need to have both. Yeah. Right now, we're having an outpouring in the natural right now. Okay. Crazy. I think there's more coming tomorrow. So, uh, you know, but but when when there is an outpouring that happens, it that can be defined as a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes it emphasizes a particular gift or ministry as well. So let's talk about, I mean, we, we're students of revival and outpourings in this place, right? We study those things because, you know, our, our whole cry is, God, do it again, right? Do it again here. And there have been outpourings like Toronto and Brownsville in the 1990s. 
right? What God did, uh, and you know, those were two different places, but around the same time frame, and outpouring that many, many were born again, many radically touched in the 90s, you know, and it wasn't just in Toronto and Brownsville. I mean, our church in the 90s in Shawnee, you just never know what was going to happen. Church was dangerous. We've gone the opposite way in our culture where we want everything safe and cookie cutter. And, um, you know, I just think we should come to church never knowing what's going to happen. Right? But there was this outpouring in Toronto and Brownsville. It was Azusa Street in the early 20th century. There was an outpouring on a group of people, uh, an interracial move in a time of great prejudice and discrimination. God moving not only among all races, but all ages, and men and women. And just an incredible move that changed the, the landscape of Christianity and actually introduced on a wide scale Pentecostalism, right? You have stuff like the healing revival of the 1950s where God raised up all these evangelists with healing gifts, did incredible things through the likes of Oral Roberts and A.A. A. Allen and Jack Coe and incredible, incredible miracles. That was an outpouring, amen? There was the Great Awakening right, that, that transformed even America. The Great Awakening that kept England from going into uh, some of the extremes that took France into great humanism. It right, changed England. Uh, all these outpourings, you know, and I, I you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm living, believing for an outpouring, right? But in the meantime, when you, you don't just say, God, you're going to move someday. In the meantime, you say, God, we're planting ourselves, and we're digging a well of awakening and revival that changes a region, that changes a state, that even, Lord, open up this well that can water a nation. Right? One of the words we got years and years ago, it's probably been eight or nine years ago from a team from Springfield, Missouri, from Day Spring, was that this church would be a Rephidim. And Rephidim was one of the places that the children of Israel uh, opened up. They uh, the, the Lord opened up a well and it watered the whole nation of Israel in the desert. Right. Now, that's the interesting thing about digging a well. Let's talk about what a revival well looks like. And I, I, We've talked about some of these things. We've had vision for some of these things. Uh, that doesn't happen overnight. It took us a while to get to this place. Right Now, when you have a well, it must be dug, unlocked, and maintained, right? A well in the natural has to be dug before it will bring forth water or oil, okay? And when you have, when you create a revival well in a culture, in a region, it, it releases a constant supply of things like personal awakening, outpourings of glory, right? healing and miracles, Deliverance, radical worship, prophetic flow, salvations, kingdom ministry, all those things start happening. And I would so I would actually say right now, most of the places that you see God moving with kind of a revival culture, they're they're wells of revival. They may not necessarily be experiencing an outpouring, but they've developed a culture where they've broken into something. I would say that about something like Bethel. Redding, California, Bethel is a well of revival, right? There are other places. The Iris Base there in Mozambique, which started as a children's home, is a well of revival for all of Africa, right? Glory of Zion in um, Corinth, Texas is a well of revival, okay? There are others, you know, and there are some that people don't know about so much, right? Because you create this well of revival where there's a constant flow. Now what happens is a well of revival really starts springing up when those who are part of a, a, 
hub of revival, a church, an apostolic center, whatever the groovy term is these days, that they determined in their heart that they're going to press into something and break a well of revival open. Yeah. How many know Oklahoma has many, many, many wells of revival? I mean, Tulsa used to be, had the nickname New Jerusalem. Right? Because of what God was doing through places like Oral, and continues to do through Oral Roberts University and Rama and some of those places. And, you know, God's done many things throughout Oklahoma. But there, there are wells of revival that God wants to redig in our, our state. And one of the things that God told us years and years ago when we started the church, was that he wanted to open up and reopen wells of revival, but also open up new wells of revival. That it wouldn't just look like the past, but there would be some new things that he would begin to pour out in our midst. Now, those are great words, aren't they? But how many know, now, thank God, I don't think I've ever dug a well. But when you dig a well, do you just walk out and say, oh, there it is. It takes, work. <laughs> it takes work to dig a well of revival. It takes contending. It takes pushing. It takes standing. It takes breaking something open. Right? And it doesn't happen overnight. Now, we've broken into something. Now, is there more? Yes. I mean, I'm still believing for an outpouring because just like the flood in the days of Noah, it said there was something that came up out of the depths, but there was also water that poured out on the earth. And there was both. And I think the best outpouring is when there's also a well of revival to sustain what God's doing. Now, the crazy thing is, you know, and the challenging thing about a revival well is that it can water many people. Even those who come to be refreshed but never dig. Right? Hallelujah. And when you are a revival well, you just have to understand that there are a lot of people who are going to come and partake of the well who never really give into what God's doing. And, and you just have to determine we're going to serve a region. I mean, I have people tell me on a regular basis stuff like, man, what's happening at the Global Harvest is incredible. The worship is amazing. And yet, they drift from church to church looking for an experience. Or I literally have people from other churches come and say, what you're doing, we're so thankful for what you're doing. But we're going to stay where we are. Now, you go where God's called you. That, that's awesome. I, I, if God's called you to a place, just don't stay in a dead church for 30 or 40 years. Investing your time, adding energy, effort, and money into something that some of those pastors have told me personally that they're never going to do what we're doing. Now, if God's called you to do it, then do it. But the thing is, when you dig a well, you understand that people are going to come and be refreshed. And that's awesome, right? It's challenging at moments. <laughs> but our call is to water a region, amen? And that's why we have to have this understanding that we're not just called to be a local church. We're not just called to grow a local church. We're called to water a region with the presence and the glory of God and to equip a region to move into kingdom ministry and values that will break open something that not only can be sustained long term, but be positioned for an outpouring that's coming. Yeah. Right? That's what we're called to do. That's what a revival well looks like. Amen. Now, it is challenging because, you know, you and Dwayne made a statement the other day that really struck me because, you know, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. It's frustrating when we have Joe Moody and her team and everybody's here jumping up and down excited and then the next week, half of those people aren't here. 
you know. But here's the deal. I want people to come in and partake of what God's doing. Because Wayne made a statement, he said, God's prepared a table for us, but that's not a trough. Because there's a mentality in the church right now that we're consumers. Oh, I'm going to show up and I'm going to get my blessing. And then I'm going to go somewhere else as the Lord leads me. Right? <laughs> daughters know the manners of the table. Now, is my goal and is God's call for us to bless a region? Yes, absolutely. But there's also a reality that sons and daughters serve and give because they understand that the inheritance isn't to be squandered. But it's to be taken, it's to be stewarded, it's to be increased for the glory of the Father. And true sons and daughters won't just walk in entitlement, they'll walk in inheritance. And they'll increase what they've been given to the glory of the Father. Right? So we're, she's, she's in getting the inheritance. Right? So I want to read out of, um, out here. Let's turn to Genesis 26. This is a, a very key scripture when we're talking about digging a well. Amen. And that was the word that Joe gave to us. That we're to dig this well. We, that we've dug this well of revival. But there's expansion coming. Now, here's, here's the irony in all that. Because I love what Joe ministered publicly. I love personal ministry that her team gave to everyone. But Joe came and sat with Jamie in a private session and basically said, thus saith the Lord. You're going to sit down for a season because if not, you're going to die. Many of you know this. We put out a letter to the school, all those things. Jamie's fought for good health for most of her life because of autoimmune issues and those things. And, and Joe came in, and you know what Joe told her? She said, the reason the Lord sent me here was to tell you this. Because she said, if you don't stop, you're, you're going to die. So Jamie has a mandate from the Lord, and she's argued with us about it. And it's not just because she's tired. Can I just say that? She's very ill. And Joe's word was, you know, the Lord could heal you. She said, but because of some of the patterns in your life, she said, you won't learn. Because there are things in your brain that need to be reprogrammed so all the systems will work. And so... Um, from beginning, well, I won't give a day. Let's just say now. <laughs> she has a mandate for three months to step out of what she's doing. At least three months. Now, the reality of that yeah. is that mean there's a call for us to step up and dig the well. And that means it's going to take some labor, some practical work, some believing, some contending, some further intercessory prayer. Because here's the thing. God's saying that it's time for increase. And isn't it just like the Lord to say it's time for increase so you go sit down? <laughs> Some of us in the school, we're all strategizing and scrambling because she's carried so much for so many years. And her phone blows up 24-7. Yeah. And everybody thinks, well, it's just me. Well, by the time you had 50 to 100 other people, 
some of them texting after 10 o'clock, some before 6 o'clock a.m. There's a possibility that her phone will be taken away from her. She's loving this and hating this at the same time, right? There's no love at all, she says. Okay. But are, are we family here? And we, it doesn't mean that Jamie's off limits. I mean, obviously, you know, you guys are our, our friends. She needs people. It's not like we're saying, don't text me. But we are. <laughs> in a sense. Right? Because here's what happens. Half the time in service, she gets texts from people at 11 o'clock wondering when spring break is. First of all, you're like, you tone down the explicit ex expletives that want to come out of your mouth. Because people know we're pastors and hello just because you're sitting on your butt at home and refuse to go read what we've given you ten times already. So we're killing this beast that's been created. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? And we're, you know, we're, we're re-figuring out how to do this because the reality is expansion puts a demand on everyone else. really struggling right now. Bless her, Lord. Right? Because, you know, it's, and, and Joe, Joe even here was like, listen, now I'm going to say this. Joe's not the first person who's come in and said this. However, Joe came in and said, if you need me, I will be here. And I will help you find practical solutions. Because, Here's the thing. It's easy to come in and say, well, you need to rest. But then never offering a solution is not producing anything. You know. So here we are. We dug a well of revival. Right? And pray for Jamie. Pray for me. I'm having to buy her a swim spa so that she'll um, take the summer off. And so I'm, I'm tight. <laughs> but she can dig a well. <laughs> so, hallelujah. So here we are. And, you know, there, we, one of the things that God's taught us over the years is when we step out in faith, he provides. So that doesn't mean that we're not practical and we don't do things like save money. Plan for the future. Right. Those are all good things. But I mean, even when we were in the middle of Mia's adoption, and the Lord told us, you know, go ahead, Emily and I came back in faith. We knew we were supposed to do that, even though it didn't make any sense for us to leave Jamie, Olivia, and tiny Mia. She was never tiny. <laughs> Right, she's the same weight, she's just grown. <laughs> she was a sumo, right? She's loving this too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll get you a swim spawn. Um, so, <laughs> so we, the moment Emily and I get on the plane, U.S. Immigration approves me and coming to America. Right? It was a huge miracle because I'm just like, I am the worst husband and father on the planet. I'm going back to America and leaving half my family, more than half, in another nation. With, we don't know that they're going to be able to leave. Maybe they can just fly into Mexico and grow across the border. That was plan B. That was plan B. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the same, never mind. Um, those moments do give you interesting perspectives. So, so yeah. Um, but we've learned that when you begin 
to move in faith because you know what God's saying. He will provide. Don't know what it's going to look like. Don't know how it's going to come. But he always does. And so by faith, she's setting the next three months out. Now, when she returns, because God's going to meet her, God's going to heal her, but that means that some of the workload that she's been carrying is going to be distributed to different people. So there are about four of us that are terrified because we're doing student interviews all summer. As a committee, right, and figuring out how can we take even more students or put students on waiting list, you know, how are we going to do this? Because God wants expansion, right? And I, I don't know about y'all, I don't really want to build a new building right now. It's super, super expensive, right? Anyway, that's a whole other story. But one of the things Joe declared to us was that, you know, God's going to bring mature harvesters and, and people who are called to contend for the harvest. And But there's also a call for people in this place who are already here. And we all can do this to mature. And to step into what God has called us to do in the harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus didn't say pray for the harvest. He said just look around you. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. You know what the biggest problem in every church in America and throughout the world is? The laborers are few. The same people that are cleaning the church are in the nursery today and teaching school, right? But that's a principle in the American church. What is it they say, like 20%? 20%. Yeah, in, in work and giving, finances. There's a call for the laborers. There's a call for mature harvesters to step in. And if, you're, and if we're not mature, because we all have areas where we need to mature. Right? There's a call for us to grow up. Right? That, and, I mean, we're in a moment in the American church right now where I think you know, there are still churches that aren't meeting. You know, and praise God for people like Cheyenne, who stood up in Pasadena, California, against the governor, and not only won that they could meet, but now Governor Newsom has to pay that $1.3 million of his legal fees. Talk about an Esther anointing. Right? Thank God we've been able to maintain in the last year. It hadn't been easy. Right? You know, I, and I, and I'm not standing on this, but I'm not going to make y'all sit in a vax and non vax section either. Amen. <laughs> some, I've heard some churches are doing that, so hallelujah. I'm getting way off here. <laughs> right? And I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> you have the freedom to do what you want to do and what you're is and I honor either one of those choices. Yes. Amen. Yes. Genesis 26. Okay, so here's what's going on in Genesis 26. There's a famine in the land, and the Lord tells Isaac, Don't go to Egypt during the famine. Okay, because anytime you see going back to Egypt in the word, it means it's bad. You're going back into bondage, you're going back into fleshly living. You're going back into all those things that God said to get out of. Okay, so God's like, don't go back to Egypt. He said, go to this place, Gerar, instead. And so Isaac goes, and he sows in a famine. Right? 
and he reaps a hundredfold, even in a famine. Right? So if you obey God, even in a famine, he'll prosper. And the thing is, he begins to prosper so much <laughs> that Abimelech, who's over the land, drives him out because he's too prosperous. And he sends him somewhere else, right? And so here's what happens. He, he, uh, let's start reading in, um, let's just start reading in verse 12. Now Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in that same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. And he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, said, so that the Philistines envied him. Again, Philistines, not good people. You'll see that in a minute. But the, 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 the blessing of God was on him so much that the ungodly people of the land began to envy him. Now, all the wells, how many of prosperity is more than money? Right? Because there are some people with money that are not prosperous. Right? <laughs> now, all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. There's a whole bunch in there that you could talk about, right? But here's the reality. Redigging a well and digging new wells means that we have to labor in the natural and the spirit to get the job done. It takes a lot to dig, right? And plus, you're digging through, obviously, dirt. Now, what does dirt represent in Scripture, okay? Dirt and dust can represent humanity. We were made out of the dust of the earth, right? And so, here's what happens. When you start redigging a revival well in a region, one of the things that you're going to contend with is the flesh of humanity. First of all, you're going to contend with your own flesh. Right? You're going to contend with all your own junk, and you're also going to contend with the religious spirit and the religious structure of a religious system in a region that doesn't quite understand what you're doing. Right? That's the reality. And so when we start digging a revival well, we're believing for a move of God, a sustained move of God. And moves of God, do things, they cut through things like programs. They cut through things like self-reliance. They, they cut through things like um, carnal thinking. They cut through things like natural opinions. Right? That's what moves of God do because how many know the, the presence and the glory of God puts a demand on us? Dwayne made that statement this week. Because a lot of times people come in and they get refreshed in a revival well. And I had one lady years and years ago when we were in the old building. She came in and she made the statement to me, I've never felt the presence of God like I have here. And she got healed, and she moved on, and we never saw her again. And her life actually stayed erect. <laughs> because there's something about the presence of God and the Word of God that will change your life if you actually submit it to it. Yeah. And generally, that happens long term. I posted a couple of days ago on Facebook because I've been pondering this message all week. I really love the suddenlies of God. I love when God just suddenly comes in and changes something. But the truth is, a suddenly usually happens because of consistency. Because of us being faithful. Showing up and contending, 
not only so that we can have a breakthrough, but so our family, natural and spiritual, can have a breakthrough. And so showing up for even our whole region to experience what God's pouring out. And nothing changes that more than consistency and faithfulness, day in and day out. Having a Christian school, I was going to say, it's one of the, and I don't mean the other one, but there's probably a better way to say this. It's like the most non sexy ministry. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Because we all want platforms. <laughs> but that everyday showing up doing chapel and loving children and their parents and that was the next thing I was going to say so that, that is a daily commitment and our teachers and our staff they, they live that right and it's not something that you just flip on or off it's like summer's here and everybody's like shaka bam right <laughs> and then we're like oh Jamie's stepping out we have to interview everybody shaka bam right <laughs> <laughs> Summer is actually one of the busiest times in the school. You know? So that that consistency, that being at morning prayer at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And, you know, if you're called to do that, then be here. You get to work on time. Hopefully. Right? That, that just being consistent. You know, you know who, when Heidi Baker had her encounter in Toronto in the 90s, where she got so overwhelmed by the presence of God that she couldn't walk for six days? Everybody's like, woo, Shaka, we want that. And she says, one of the most frightening experiences of my life. And she said, when she was lying there incapacitated, you know what the Lord said to her? He said, I'm sending you one of my choicest servants to care for you. It wasn't John and Carol Arnott. It wasn't Randy Clark. It wasn't Wesley and Stacey Campbell. It was the night watchman for the church facility. There you go. Who basically would take her to the bathroom as she lay on the floor because she couldn't go by herself. An unknown, unseen person whose name I don't know. Who ministered to Heidi in her moment of greatest encounter. Make a swing. We all want moves of God. But who? We've joked about this before. Who puts, who restocks the toilet paper? In a move or revival that goes on for years. And we have people steal them in our conferences. <laughs> Bless them, Lord. Right. You're that desperate. Of course, a year ago, you know, there was, a, and that wasn't even during a shortage. It was six months before, you know. They were prophetic. The Lord told them to steal away. Um, the Lord's leading me to steal this toilet paper. Well, yeah. we're giving to a region, right? The moves of God, they just, they just cut through the junk. If we let it. Now, one of the things that, I mean, the enemy really likes to do is he'll, he'll pull on the appetites and thoughts of carnal people to create division to plug a well. Right? Because if the Lord, now listen, it's not all about us in this city. I, I am so thankful for other churches and people that are contending for the same things. But when the Lord, when we came here, the Lord told us to do several people to redig a well of revival, which means the well of revival had been plugged up a long time. 
had numerous people through the years come in and tell me privately, the Lord's going to allow you to go down a road where we see obstacles. And other people haven't been able to get over those hurdles and those obstacles. But the Lord says that he's going to allow you guys to go and get through this. And that's, you know, that doesn't make me be like, oh, glory to God, I'm the uber apostle. You know what it does? It makes me want to fall on my face. It scares me because it means that God, first of all, only you can do this. And then, Lord, may it, because there's this always this divine tension in truth that really only the Lord can do those things. But at the same time, the Lord limits himself to people who are willing to do what he's asked them to do in order for breakthrough to come. Because the Lord could just be like, boom, here's revival. But if we're unwilling to steward what he gives, it'll be over like that. Well, talking about Shayon, I mentioned Shay already once. Shay said they were getting all these words about revival, revival, revival. And it was 10 years before revival came to their church. And you know what he said? We weren't ready. We couldn't have sustained what he wanted to pour out to because we were too immature to handle what he wanted to give us. Now, are we seeing a revival culture and a well of revival and all those things? Yeah, but is there more? And, and God hasn't given it yet because we're not ready. And we could get ready very quickly. Right? God can accelerate things. Amen. Now, here's another thing that, that plugs a well up. Is the Philistines had plugged the wells up. Right? Now, when you read about Philistines in Scripture, they always oppose the people of God. Right? They're always the enemies of God. Amen. And if you're going to dig a well in a region, you will have to contend against regional powers that do not want to move with God. There are principalities and powers. That don't want to move. And I'm just going to say this. Because we talked about warfare a lot. A principality is more concerned about shutting down a move of God. And keeping people out of the kingdom. Than you having a bad day. <laughs> and a lot of times what we call warfare. Are bad decisions. Yep. Now that doesn't discount that there is a reality principalities and powers that have labored for decades to put structures in place to oppose the move of God. Again, there's a tension, right? But if you're if you're contending for revival in a region, you're, you're going to be opposed by those things. And so digging a well will require boldness, commitment, and tenacity. Individually and corporately. We have a regional mandate. Amen. And what God has called us to do, and this is not to criticize any local church, but it's bigger than just being a local church. Amen. We're called to a region. Right? I think those of you that came Thursday night were able to come to our graduation. You saw that. And that wasn't even the biggest graduation and award ceremony we've had. All right. Next year's going to be a bigger year, probably because of the number of graduates. But, but there's something. And you know what? I was just thinking about the first year or two of the school. <laughs> and the stuff that we labored through and even trying to really say this nicely. People who, who didn't like us in those first few years are sending children and grandchildren to our school. Because there's a fruit that's coming forth. Now, were there days in the church and the school when we were like, 
we're done. I kind of felt that way last Sunday. I'm just being real. Let's pack up and go work for Global Awakening. Sometimes when you have these great moments of breakthrough and then the next Sunday, half those people aren't here. And I know there are legitimate things that happen. I'm thankful for people that are on vacations and holidays. And, oh, that's awesome. But sometimes you know, we're going to do it, right? Jobs and all those things. But Sundays in the hardest moments are when we need to be the most faithful. say that again. Because sometimes in the hardest moments is when we need to be the most faithful. And it's more than showing up on a Sunday morning. But we've got a whole generation right now. Well, the early church was willing to die for their faith, and we've got a whole generation right now that can't show up on a Sunday morning. Because it's too spiritual for them. Well, they're too spiritual for it. I don't know. I don't mean this to be condemning. I, I, there, there's just this call. And I want us to go out of here edified because we're family. And, and God's called us to labor and dig even more for this revival well because the time of expansion. I want to commend each and every one of you. Some of you have been here for years. Thank you. Thank you for even moments when it was like the 10, 15 of us, we were just like, right. praise the Lord. <laughs> Shock of bam, right? And you just stood. Some of you have come along throughout the years. And I just want to thank all of you for your encouragement. Because that's what it takes to dig a well of revival. And that's what it takes for only, not only us to partake of the refreshing that God's pouring out, but to water a whole region. That's the call. Right? And it requires great generosity. The, the time we went to Bethel's leader advance, someday I hope to get back. I don't know. But we walked in and I wanted to weep. I felt so intimidated in that leader's advance because there was such a generosity and a willingness to give that I felt that place. There are times that we go on the grounds on Gloria Zion, and I feel Jamie made the comment we were there one day on a Christmas thing they were doing, just in their garden, and they had food trucks and all these vendors set up, and she said, you feel the deep, deep thing in the very ground here that people have been pouring into for years. You feel it in the earth. The Dutch sheets and the Peter Wagner Doris Wagner's and the Cindy Jacobs and the Chuck Pierce's and all those things. You feel all that faith that's been poured into a movement. You feel it at Bethel. You know. It takes people who are saying, God, we're going to host you. And we're going to love your presence more than anything else. And not only are we going to love it, and get refreshed and fed by it, we're going to be those that cultivate this presence and this glory. Because there's a region, there's a state, there's a city, there's a nation. And some of the things that God said, there are nations that even God's going to bring here. Will you contend for a well of revival? Will you contend for that? I think because the very
very fact that you're here is your gifts. But in moments of expansion, God just puts a greater demand on all of us. I'm feeling the demand, even because what well, I'm going to have to carry for Jamie. While I'm also facilitating a course, being a teaching assistant for another course. There's a demand on us. This morning, let's just all stand. I think this is a good anniversary message, amen? Even though our anniversary is until next week. Right? I think it's a good message. I'm convicted, but I'm encouraged at the same time because... God's done something the last 13 years. I'm so thankful for all of you. Let's just let him take us higher. Amen. Father, we say yes to you today. Father, at a deeper level. Father, in the midst of the labor, I know that some of this is spiritual labor even, where we, even this morning in worship, when that, that swirl of the angelic just began to open up in a greater way. And Lord, we just said yes to you in worship. And even right now, there's expansion that you want for us as a ministry, as a revival hub, as a local church, as an apostolic center. And, Lord, we, we don't even know what that looks like. But, Lord, today we, we corporately say yes to you. We individually say yes to you. And, Lord, you so want people to come and experience you and know you, to be born again. Father, you want to take people out of darkness bring them into light. And Father, we want to be those that labor with you to see that happen. Father, whether it means intercessory prayer, whether it means taking care of babies, cleaning a toilet, worshiping, leading worship, praying for the sick, whatever that looks like, teaching, preaching, mowing, Father, whatever that looks like, we just want to say yes to you today. Father, I thank you for this moment that we're in. Thank you for what you're going to do even. So many coming to be baptized. Lord, there's something really powerful happening. And Father, we just in our faith and obedience, we say yes to you again today. We give you glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, worship team holding on to this word for a week or so. Uh, I just, last Sunday, I was very aware um, of the song that Alan wrote years ago for the 100th birthday of Ardville. And I just was also very aware there are songs hanging in the atmosphere. And this is not a new word. You guys have been prophesying this over and over and over. But there is an anthem of worship that you guys are going to write. And so, worship team, just put your hands up, put your hands out, whatever. Lord, thank you, Father, that these worshipers, God, you're giving them anthems of worship. Lord, I thank you that there are and the angelic beings that have just been coming and filling this place over the last days, weeks, and months with assignments from heaven for songs. Lord, I thank you that you're going to give them to them. And even over these next hours and days, there are fresh downloads from heaven that you're giving to worshipers in this place. And so, Father, thank you that there are songs of revival that are unique to this city. This high place of worship that you're going to raise up. Father, give those things. Let that impartation come even now, God, in 
Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Amen. Simple word, but just it, it just hit me last week. I was like, oh, I feel that song that God's giving. So we get to carry it out and sing anthems of revival. Amen? Praise God. If you need prayer, I'm going to ask the intern team to come and pray. Um, if you have a physical need that you need healing for, come and receive prayer. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great day. Have a great holiday weekend. And we'll see you next Sunday. And don't forget to sign up. And uh, next Sunday is going to be powerful. Let's just all celebrate together. Amen. Bless you guys.